Alive Book One Chapter Eleven David did his best to keep up with the man named Sai, who moved almost effortlessly through the thick woodland, but his feet beat painfully on the mossy earth, and there were new scratches stinging his flesh where thickets and low-hanging branches had appeared suddenly in his path to take their passing toll. David had caught sight looking over his shoulder a few times, but had seen no reprieve in the man's face, only impatience and a hint of humor. David had learned something about humor in his short time among the Orga, but he could see nothing funny about this situation, or indeed any situation that had befallen him since he had come to reside in this fragile shell of flesh. He steeled himself against the pain and struggled on, lest what little he had in the world was lost to the bandits. He had no idea how much time had passed or how far they had run, but he knew he could go no further. His brow was dripping with sweat and his breath coming deep and painfully fast. He was about to give up the chase, to admit defeat and let fate have her way with him, when he saw that the gang of boys had stopped far ahead, in a clearing near the base of a tree-covered hill. Sai stopped running and walked calmly to his gang. They welcomed him with upraised hands. The big man slapped each palm and then turned to regard David as he came stumbling into the clearing, out of breath and miserable. Looks like someone needs a trip through the gauntlet, eh? Sai quipped. The boys laughed, all except the one Sai had called Wizzy, who only twisted his young face in unbridled disgust. But none of this mattered to David. Sai's apparent insult would have made no sense to him even if he'd had enough mental energy to decipher it. As it was, he only had enough to fall to his knees and hold up his arms in surrender. I can't go any further is how David had meant to conclude this breathy appeal. But he could not finish the sentence, so he decided to finish his descent instead and lay in the deep grass of this place. It was fresh and cool against his face, and he felt like he might have just lain there forever if strong hands had not yanked him up. <laughs> Almost home, boy, Sai said, chuckling and picking David up like a doll to set him on his feet again. David wobbled a bit, but somehow managed to stay upright. Wizzy snorted loudly, but David would not be provoked into looking, which he was somehow sure was the boy's intention. The group set out again, walking this time, and at a merciful pace. David was both encouraged and mystified that the bandits would show him any decency, but he soon realized that their slowness was not from any sense of courtesy, but of caution. They were passing up a gradual incline beneath a dark shroud of overhanging trees, and they seemed to be cautious about where they stepped, as if there might be small, flesh-hungry creatures lurking in the bush. Sai glanced back and then whispered something to Wizzy. The boy made another disgusted snort before dropping back and moving to David's side. Stay by me, pork chop, the boy said. David was too tired to ask the meaning of this new insult. As the shadows grew deeper, David noticed that the group began moving into single file. He was about to inquire the reason for this when he felt a shove from his side. It was Wizzy, again. Get in line, pork chop, the brat whispered. And keep your tongue, he added, before David could respond. Not that David had the strength to trade insults or even the experience to know from what words the boy might take offense. But he was determined to get even, eventually. The line began to slow, and finally came to a halt. Ahead, David saw Sai step to the base of a large tree. Then the man knocked on the tree. Then he began talking to it. Oh, David thought, he's insane. Now it all makes sense. The thought struck a funny note in his mind, and he was surprised to hear a chuckle come from his own lips. He was not so surprised to feel Wizzy's foot bounce against his backside. David turned on the boy. Stop that, he hissed. 
Quiet pork chop, Wizzy snarled back with a look that meant business. David returned the boy's glare for a moment, but then relented. Later, he thought. Later. He was getting more comfortable with the idea of revenge and wondered when it would morph into more than just fantasy. But his anger with Wizzy fell away when he realized that Psy was not engaged in a lunatic monologue. The tree was talking back. He strained an ear and heard Psy say, Come on now, before the Skeeters wake up and eat us alive out here. Then, amazingly, the tree responded. Why the back trail, Psy? It said in a light electronic drawl. You in trouble or something? We got us a guest, the man explained. The talking tree let out a burst of static and then some words that David could not make out. The boys in line all turned to regard him with cool skepticism. Sai turned, an annoyed look on his face, and gestured for David to come forward. Hurry up, Wizzy said, and gave him a parting kick. David decided not to honor the rudeness with a response. The boys parted to allow him passage. He stepped by the young bandits, wondering which one of them had Teddy. When he finally reached Sai, the man pushed him in front of the tree. There, see? Just a kid, Sai said impatiently. David looked up and down the crusty bark of the tree, but saw nothing like eyes or a mouth. But he guessed it was able to see him somehow and it definitely spoke. And how do you know he ain't a plant? The tree responded. It was apparently a girl. David didn't know trees could be delineated in that fashion. Sai flailed his arms in the air. Damn it, he's just some lost brat. Now drop the gates. But the tree wasn't yet convinced about whatever it was Sai was trying to convince it. What's that on your wrist, boy? It said. David held up his arm to show the ID bracelet. I got it from the hospital, he explained, almost truthfully. How in the hell did you miss that, Sai? The tree yelled. Sai grumbled, grabbed David's arm, and ripped the wristband off with one strong yank. Then he tossed it far up the trail ahead. A sudden flash erupted in the darkness for a split second. Then the bracelet was gone. Well, there goes my identity, David thought. At least he didn't have to be Susan anymore. Are you happy now? Sai said. And how do you know it wasn't traced? The tree scolded. Because we made it this far, Sai replied. Well, that's some specious reasoning, the tree said. Sai punched the stubborn plant. Damn it, Nance! He's skin. He's safe. We're tired and hungry. Now let us in. A few of the boys seconded this, but the tree seemed reluctant to accept unannounced guests. It let out a rash of words that David didn't know, but were obviously intended to impart the severest disapproval. Sai had his own string of angry words. He let them fly, and then said, Okay, just leave the gates up, Nance, and then try to find yourself another crew, because we're coming in. With that, he started storming up the thin trail. The boys hesitated, undecided whether to follow Sai or heed the tree's warning. But slowly they began to step up behind their leader. David stood his ground in confusion. He thought he heard the tree make a sigh of resignation, or it might have been anger. Wizzy walked by and tapped David on the arm. Amazingly, the boy had no kicks or insults to offer. He only shook his head and gestured for David to follow. Man, oh man, Wizzy sighed as they walked. Sparks are going to fly tonight. David was curious enough to inquire, but angry enough to get the explanation later, and from someone else. As he stepped into line behind Wizzy, he thought he saw rows of thin red beams of light in the shadows ahead of the group, but they vanished as Sai trudged confidently into the foliage and beyond the place where the strange lights had once formed a barrier. The thick greenery finally gave way to another clearing, but this one was cloaked from the sky by a canopy of intertwining tree branches. On the other side of the bare earthen floor sat a dilapidated building, 
that looked as if it might have once been filled with people wearing dark suits and grim expressions, carrying thin briefcases as they rushed about busy corridors, chatting into their headsets. Now it was just two stories of broken glass and rusted frames, home to a roving band of underage bandits and their leader. David wondered what kind of chaos might lie within. As they approached the withered structure, a woman appeared in the doorway. She was older, perhaps the age of Dr. Chen, and had a shock of thick red curls atop her head and a face full of piercings and elaborate tattoos inked into her pale flesh. She leaned against the doorframe and placed her hand on her hip as she regarded the approaching boys with a baleful glare. I should have just left the gate up and fried your sorry asses, she said. But nobody seemed impressed by this sentiment. Hello, Nance, Cy replied dryly. It's so nice to hear your sweet voice again, my precious jewel. Why don't you see to our guest? He gestured to David and then slipped nonchalantly by the woman and into the unlit corridor. She gritted her teeth but didn't try to stop him. The others filed by her slowly, one by one, offering the woman conciliatory smiles as they passed. Wizzy chuckled under his breath and gave David a departing punch on the shoulder before joining the others. The woman twisted a brow at David, as if she was wondering how he could still be alive. You look even worse up close, she said, analyzing him for a moment. Then something in her gaze softened. Ah, that cheek is puffed up like a melon. Bet that tooth is killing you, huh? She said. It's my ear, David said. It's your tooth, boy, she replied. Looks like an impacted molar. Nance sighed like a mother whose work is never done. Well, come on, she said, and stepped into the building. David was led down a dark hallway, following the sound of Nance's footfalls ahead of him. He could hear the gang of boys laughing somewhere in the building. He started to head in that direction, but heard Nance say, this way, and turned to follow the sound of her voice. He heard the swishing of a door opening ahead and saw a sudden light erupt from a room. Nance was silhouetted against the glow for a moment before she stepped inside. David stepped in after her and saw something he hadn't quite expected, an immaculate room of sterile white walls and polished steel surfaces, medical instruments, of the kind he had seen in the hospital, were neatly arranged on shining metal shelves or resting in bottles of colorful cleaning solutions. Complicated machinery hummed about the place. Digital displays shone rows of zeros from a myriad of multicolored readouts. David's surprise must have reached his face, for Nance laughed at whatever expression she saw there. She gestured to a thick chair in the center of the room. David crawled into the chair. It was huge and soft as a worn pillow. Then the thing whirred to life suddenly and embraced him, locking his arms in place. He started to struggle, but knew it was futile. It was too late to change his mind now. Nance winked and held up a small metal cylinder. The harmless-looking device emitted a fierce red light from the upraised end and David could swear it was making a high-pitched whine as she approached. Big boys don't cry, she said as she went to work. The extraction was quick, and David didn't suffer any more pain than he had at the hands of the men in the hospital, the silent ones in white lab coats who had come to pinch and prod and asked the same questions over and over again. When Nance was done, she packed some gauze into the back of his mouth and told him to keep it there for the night. Then she handed him something small and white. David studied it carefully. This was a part of me, he realized, reminded once again about the frailty of this body. 
He rolled his tongue over the cauterized wound in the back of his mouth and wondered if it had really been necessary to cut the tooth out. Nance seemed to notice his dark introspection. It'll all be good in the morning, honey, she said, and turned back to whatever she'd been doing. Honey, David repeated, pensively. Nance shot David another one of her sour looks. He was starting to understand that this was probably her usual expression, and that maybe she wasn't as mean as the piercings and the angry tattoos implied. Yeah, honey, she said, flipping off the lights and ushering David back into the dark hallway. Nobody ever call you that before. Well, yes, David replied. I mean, no, but I understand. It's just that, well, I didn't expect... You don't seem as mean as the others. Nance let out a laugh that echoed through the empty halls. You think they're mean, she said. They jumped on me and stole my money and my bear, he explained angrily. That is definitely mean. And I think... He paused a moment, trying to recall the legal restrictions on human interactions. I'm pretty certain that's illegal, he said. He couldn't see Nance's face as they made their way through the dark, but the tone of her voice implied a shrug. Yeah, well, you're still alive, ain't you? She said. David considered the logic of this response. It was setting the bar rather low, but he had to concede that he was, in fact, quite alive. I guess you're right, he said, reluctantly. But I almost died trying to keep up with Sai. And that kid named Wizzy kept kicking me and... Something told David that complaining about name-calling wouldn't come off too well. And stuff, he said, instead. Nance laughed. Yeah, the Wiz kid can be a pain in the butt sometimes. But that's only because Sai's always protecting the brat. He thinks Wizzy's some kind of genius. Personally, and don't tell him I said this, but I just don't see it. David made a sound of agreement and then felt Nance grab his shoulder and turn him down another dark hallway. He heard the boys' voices raised somewhere above. Nance grumbled under her breath. David pondered the irritated sound and wondered why she put up with them if she didn't want them around. The secret is not to let Wizzy know that it bothers you, Nance continued. You just act like you could care less, and then she'll stop. She? David blurted. Nance didn't respond, but David heard her sigh, as if she was wondering if he'd been living under a rock. Where the hell are you from, boy? she said. David thought for a moment. I don't remember, he finally replied. The response didn't seem to surprise her. Nance led David to an elevator and still in complete darkness, they rode to the upper floor. When the doors parted and the light flooded in, David was once again left speechless. The walls that had once separated offices had been knocked down, and the bandit's living space spanned the entire length of the building's upper floor. It was decorated with fine accoutrements, as the palaces of pirates are so prone plush couches and chairs of ornate design, things that must have been stolen from the wealthiest homes. Paintings and statues and holographic works of art hung from walls or sprouted from tables with intricate designs carved into their antique wood. All around lay piles of bounty from the gang's exploits. There were games and clothing and musical instruments strewn about the place, as if the boys had grown tired of them and simply tossed them aside. Computers and unmoving mecca filled a far-off corner. David couldn't see Teddy among the discards, but he couldn't see as well as he used to. He wondered what had happened to his toy friend, but decided it would be better to not press the issue, for now. In the center of the room sat a large cubicle embracing a complex console, and from this sprouted numerous screens displaying various views of the surrounding woods. In one of the monitors, David saw the trail he had walked to get here, and realized he was looking through the eyes of the tree. Oh, he said. 
and was glad that no one had heard him, lest he have to explain why he'd been surprised by something so obvious. The gang of boys were in various places around the room, their feet propped up on expensive-looking footstools, talking, playing games, sleeping, or raiding a large refrigerator near the back of the huge place. Then he noticed a strange-looking older fellow. The man was thin and proper, clothed in a ragged black suit. His face held an expression of intense disinterest with anything that might be occurring around him, but the boys seemed to be ordering him about. Neville, bring me that drink, they said, and Neville, did you finish washing my stuff? And Neville, make me a sandwich. David understood immediately. He looked away. It was no longer his concern. He had a new life now. He followed Nance to the place where Cy was resting. Found yourself a real kitten, didn't you? She said, throwing herself down on a tapestry-laden couch near Cy. The man had kicked back into a large throne-like chair and was fiddling with something in his hand. He laughed without looking up from whatever he was doing. Told you he was a pork chop, he said. Why do you keep calling me that, David said. A voice rose from the space behind Sai's chair. There's two types of people in the world, it said. Those that eat and those that get eaten. David was already too familiar with that voice and braced himself for the insults he was sure were coming next. Wizzy popped her head up from behind the couch and shot him a mocking look. We call him woofs and pork chops, and you sure as hell ain't no wolf. Cy chuckled. Nance shot David a knowing glance. David was searching his mind for words that might sting his young abuser, but then he remembered the woman's words and just pretended he had not heard Wizzy. You have a lot of nice things here. David said to Sai, Why do you dress like that? I mean, with so many nice clothes around. The man cocked an eyebrow at David. Always dress appropriate to the job, boy, he said, and went back to what he was doing. Oh, David said. Why do you dress like a sewer rat? Wizzy chided. David thought he actually had a good comeback for this one, but then decided against it. So, can I have something to eat now? He said, instead, ignoring Wizzy's taunt. Cy gestured over his shoulder. Help yourself. The fridge is right over there, he said, still engrossed in whatever toy he held in hand. Thank you, David said politely. He smiled broadly at Wizzy as he passed, just to show he was above it all, and took some comfort in the grimace that crossed her deceptively boyish features. Precisely when David became one of them was not clear, but it seemed that the lost boys of the forest had just accepted his presence, and by the time they were settling in for the night, were acting as if he had always been among them. Pork Chop became David's official handle, and he was informed that should he protest this name, they would call him something worse. Wizzy had laughed and suggested Doggerts or Bush Patty. But an older boy named Derek, one of the boys who had helped hold David down while the others searched his pockets, explained that these were slang for animal droppings. David settled for pork chop. The whiz kid, as David learned was Wizzy's official title, tried to goad him into a few arguments as he ate, but just like Nance said, she gave up when David shrugged the insults off. He chewed his meal of wild rice and stringy beef carefully, trying not to agitate the cauterized hole at the back of his jaw. The pain was slowly coming back as the anesthesia wore off, but it was just a dull ache. When he was finished eating, Neville came to him with a towel and fresh clothing. David searched the Mecca's eyes, as if he might see some recognition there. But the service spot only gave him a disinterested glance, and then pointed in the direction of a stairway alongside the room. The shower is there, sir. You are allotted ten minutes, it said. 
and walked away. Where is he from? David said. Found him, Wizzy said. But she would not elaborate. Instead, she suggested that David shower quickly before his stench made her puke. He smiled and walked away. The water felt so good on his bruised and scratched flesh that David got lost in his thoughts and spent more than his allotted time in the shower. Angry cries and threats interrupted his introspection, but David was starting to understand that this was just their way of communicating. He finally shut the water off and put on the clothing that Neville had given him. When David gazed into the mirror, he wasn't sure if he even knew the person looking back at him. The new clothing was dark and stylish. It looked expensive and felt smooth against his skin. It fit in all the right places, but billowed loosely over his thin frame. He guessed that it was supposed to fit this way. He'd seen the other boys wearing similar things. The once smooth skin of his face and arms was now dotted by small scars and insect bites. And being living flesh, it had tanned from exposure to the sun. He looked older, somehow. But the real difference was in his eyes. There was something new there. David didn't really feel any different. Tired, yes, and nervous about his future. But the face in the mirror held something new. Something dark. Yes, it was the eyes, he decided. They were changing in some vital way. Something was happening beneath his awareness like the time he had caught his hands wringing unconscious knots in the hospital bedsheets. But this change was happening in his mind and his heart. Someone pounded on the door. Get your skinny ass out of there. It was the voice of an older boy. David responded quickly. Okay, okay, just, just wait your damn turn, he yelled. But he felt an immediate sense of dread. Had he been presumptuous? Had he gone too far? His fear fell away when he heard the boy outside laughing. Oh, pork chop, the voice said, almost whimsically. You a trip. Yeah, David replied, looking again at the dark-clad stranger in the mirror and wondering what would become of him. I guess I am, he said. As David was drifting off to sleep, on the cot that Neville had laid out for him. He heard someone approaching. He rolled over to see Sai's large frame silhouetted against the soft glow from the security monitors, which was the only light in the room now. The man leaned close and spoke in a whisper. You're one of us now, pork chop. Tomorrow you start earning your keep, he said. David waited for further explanation but none seemed to be coming. How? he said. Sai made that low, ambiguous chuckle. (laughs) Well, boy, we're bandits. You smart enough to figure it out. With that, the man walked away, leaving David alone with his questions and uncertainty. A troubling thought came then, as he considered his new predicament. He knew he would eventually find his way home, by Mommy's side, where he belonged. For now he would play along with the gang, just until he found Teddy and a means of escape. Then he would continue his quest. He would let nothing stop him, nothing. But, and this was the new thought fretting in the back of his mind, by the time he found her, By the time he had lied and stolen and kicked his way through all the ceaseless obstacles that fell into his path, would he become someone else? Would Mommy even know him? And would he still be someone she could love?